Dan Jenkins is the most influential golf writer, sports writer really, of the last thousand years. We all grew up reading him. Three generations tried writing like him. He invented the language of golf. Semi-tough, chicken fried with cream gravy, hold the sushi. No coincidence it had a Texas accent. His best-selling books celebrated America's greatest golf holes, were dead solid perfect at the movies, and made us realize we were the doggedest victims of them all. His love for the game came through his characters like Moron Tom and Foot the Free and Barbara Jane Bookman. He brought satire to sport. There's nobody like Dan who could take you inside the 99 Ryder Cup locker room where Captain Crenshaw said, I'm a great believer in fate. Fate's gonna take care of us. To which a male voice replied, what can fate do about our shirts? It's been said that all his leading men in fiction, the Bobby Joe Grooves and Billy Clyde Puckets, reflected Dan's irreverent, good-hearted nature in the fight against greed and corporate sponsorship. But the real heroes of his books were women, modeled after his benevolent wife, June Jenkins, the original shapely adorable that he so often wrote about. Dan Jenkins of Sports Illustrated. He's not a bad golfer. He roots for the leaderboard, for the big names, but he taught us not to take them so seriously. After the 96 Masters, when Greg Norman said he could have been a brain surgeon if he just took the time to study medicine, Jenkins wrote, maybe so, but he wouldn't operate on this cowboy. Not on Sundays, anyhow. Jenkins has now covered 210 major championships. Back in the days when he wrote on a typewriter, I was always amazed at how clean his copy was on first draft. How could anybody get it so right, so fast, so good? Maybe. Yes, sir! At Nicholas's 86 Masters, I remember sitting next to him in the old Quonset hut at Augusta, while veteran columnists were keeling over all around us from the pressure of writing the biggest event of their lives. Dan just slid a piece of paper into the typewriter carriage and typed continuously, elegantly, his prose funny, poignant, full of historical perspective without any corrections, while the Battle of Gettysburg went on around him. An hour after the last putt had dropped, he handed me the manuscript, put on his blue blazer and TCU cap and said, I've left space for you to insert the appropriate quote. See you for cocktails. People might think it's Jack Nicholas or Ben Hogan, but on deadline, when it really matters, Dan Jenkins stands alone as the greatest who has ever lived. I'm glad they put me up here first because Tiger Woods and I have an early tea time tomorrow. <laughs> uh, I really enjoyed that video. I thought it was great and I was perfectly accurate. Uh, that vase, by the way, in another life, that thing would have been filled with scotch, but uh, at this stage of my development, it's going to be iced tea. Uh, of course, I'm delighted and overwhelmed and pleased and all those things to be taken into this society. It's a great club, and uh, I'm particularly pleased to be taken in as a vertical human. Um, <laughs> I may be the first guy that ever did that. Uh, now I'm also happy about the rumor that if I wear this blazer to my neighborhood drugstore, I'll get uh, some discount on my medications. <laughs> well, the first person I want to thank, quite serious, is that everything I've had that's been good in my life uh, has come to me through the incomparable June Jenkins. She's my, my bride of 52 years, my sweetheart, my secret weapon, actually. Uh, I need to thank an awful lot of people here, and I'll try to do it as quick as I can. But first, I want to start with thanking my kids for being here, uh, my entrepreneurial sons, Marty and Danny, and my uh, successful prize-winning
sports columnist for the Washington Post, Sally Jenkins. She and I agree that she's been the she and I agree that she's been the best writer in the family for several years now. <laughs> I also want to thank all my friends who came here from Fort Worth and Colonial and Shady Oaks and New York and Boston and, and even some from Ponte Vedra and probably a few strangers that I bought drinks for at Elaine's and <laughs> DJ Clark's in New York who became their best friend. Uh, I have to thank Dean Beeman and Tim Fincham two great commissioners who got this thing built, got this whole World of Golf Village done. It was a marvelous idea and, and a, a tremendous undertaking. And they will be thanked several times tonight, but I want to be the first to do it because, first of all, I don't know how they did it, but they did, and it's going to keep on growing. Now, I have to tell you that if you're a writer, uh, famous fleeting. Uh, a few years ago at Atlanta Airport, this guy came up to me and said, I know you. And I said, I don't think so. And he said, no, 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 you're, I, I've seen you. Uh, why do I know you? I said, I'm just a guy catching an airplane. He said, no, 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 I know you. you. I've seen you somewhere. Who are you? And I said, well, I thought he'd maybe see me on television playing a book or something. I said, well, I'm just a, I'm a guy who writes for a national sports magazine, and I've written four or five bestsellers. And he said, well, you don't have to be sarcastic. To, uh, to justify my inclusion in this terrific society, I went back and looked at everybody who was in it and did some statistics. It turns out that I have known 95 of these people when they were living. Uh, I've uh, written stories about 73 of them. I've had cocktails and drinks with 47 of them, and I've played golf with 24 of them. So I want somebody else to try to go up against that record. Um, <laughs> just to drop a few names, some of the people I've played golf with were Ben Hogan about 40 times, Byron Nelson, Sam Sneed, Jack Nicklaus, Arnold Palmer, Gary Player, and even Babe Zaharias. And the ladies down here, these LPGA ladies will appreciate this. I played with Babe in 1951 at Rivercrest Country Club in Fort Worth in the old Texas Women's Open. I, had the, I was playing on the teacher golf team at the time, but I was also working for the Fort Worth Press. And I went over to Babe when I found her chipping and putting around the putting green. I said, uh, are you going to play a practice round? And she just kind of looked at me. She knew me from a couple of years earlier. And uh, I said, if you're going to play a practice round, I want to play, on, play along with you. And she said, how much you got in your pocket? <laughs> and I said, well, I guess I could manage a $2 Nassau or something like that. So we played, jumped in the golf cart, played in about two and a half hours. I thought, you know, there's no lady golfer that's going to out hit me. Well, she did, but that little low hook went out there about 275. Not only out hit me, she shot 71, beat me out $8. And, uh, <laughs> but she wouldn't take the money. She said, I don't mind robbing a college kid, but I can't rob, rob a newspaper guy. We need you people. <laughs> and I know these other ladies have heard this story before, and she dropped a swarm of her standard lines on me. We came around the golf course, around the clubhouse to the putting green, and we saw George, her husband, George Saharius, who was an ex-pro wrestler, and he was one of those guys who got wider the longer you looked at him. <laughs> and she said, look at that. She said, 12 years ago, I married a Greek god. Now I'm just married to a damn Greek. <laughs> uh, as for all those majors I've covered, uh, it's obviously a record that'll never be broken because uh, one day there's not going to be any more magazines and, and newspapers that you can, in, in paper. And uh, for that matter, there's not going to be any more people. Uh, <laughs> it's just going to be vampires and text messages and some voice saying, turn left now. <laughs> uh, this was my 62nd Masters in a row. and. That's a lot of country ham and red-eye gravy, any way you look at it. <laughs> but I've enjoyed every minute of it. And I'll be going to Olympic next month, uh, where I've su suffered several tragedies in the past as a post writer. Uh, every time I go there, Jack Flake beats Ben Hogan, Billy Casper beats Arnold Palmer, Scott Simpson beats Tom Watson, 
Lee Jansen beats Payne Stewart. So I'm quite sure that next month, Phil Mickelson and Rory McIlroy and uh, Bubba Watson are all going to lose in a playoff to Jack Flake's long-lost nephew. <laughs> uh, and I'll be there to cover it on deadline. Uh, I have to uh, cut to the chase here and get around to Ben Hogan because uh, I knew him better than any other writer. I played golf with him over 40 times all through the 1950s when he was at his peak. And uh, he called me up one day. I used to watch him practice. He said, let's go, we go play. And uh, I could keep up with him a little bit. But one day in 1956, he called me at the paper on the phone and said, I want you to, I'm gonna play an exhibition for the US Olympic Fund, and I want you in the foursome. And I said, I, Ben, there's gotta be somebody better than me. He said, no, you all won't, we'll have a lot of fun. My brother will play, and Raymond Gafford will play at Red Sea, there'll be four of us. <clears throat> so I go out there, I work half a day. I expected maybe a couple hundred people there are 3,000 people lying in the first fairway at Colonial. <clears throat> I somehow got off the tee, okay, down the fairway without injuring myself or anybody else. And then I topped a three wood. Then I topped another three wood. Then I top scraped a five iron. And all I want to do is dig a hole and disappear. I could hear giggles in the gallery. Like, Who's this idiot? What's this, how's this guy doing here? And then I realized Ben was walking beside me as I was going up to my ball. And he gave me the greatest golf tip at the time, under those conditions I've ever had, this proves he had a sense of humor. He said, you can probably swing faster if you try hard enough. <laughs> and that's a true story. I must have looked like I was swatting for some mosquitoes or something. I, I slowed it down and got around in something under 80 or anything. But uh, it's true that uh, he offered to give me a lesson one day after we played a practice round at Colonial. We were sitting around having a nice tea or a drink or something. And uh, he said, you know, you, you, you can keep the ball in a fairway off the tee and you're, you're a good putter. He said, I wish I had your putting stroke, which is true. But he said, everything in between is a mystery. And I said, yeah. <laughs> he said, if you will work with me three days a week for the next four months, you might be good enough to play in the National Amateur, qualify and play the National Amateur. And I said, Ben, I said, I, I'm flattered, and I, I appreciate that, and I, I'm embarrassed to have to turn down an offer to, of a golf, free golf lessons from the greatest player in the world, uh, but I just want to be a sports writer. That's all I ever wanted to be. And he looked at me like I'd seen him look at other people with that cold stare, and you don't know whether you're going to get a bullet in the head or a dagger in your heart, and you're waiting, and you wait. Seems like an eternity. And then he kind of smiled and said, well, Keep working at it. <laughs> well, that's what I've been doing for the last 60 years. And uh, I guess I'll keep doing it till they I topple over. And uh, then they start to work on my tombstone. And I've already picked out two things. The first thing is going to be, I knew this would happen. <laughs> and uh, well, I got a better one. The better one is, you guys hold it down here. I'm off to the next great adventure. Thank you all.